Okay, so this is me, and this is joint work with Peter Jonsson also at six. Um, and people at Ericsson as well, but basically we have been doing most of the work and, and talking to them. Yeah, so it we are just two people at six who are doing this project, which is, uh, you know, um, this kind of two-person half-time project going from from um, signal processing applications of a programming language is compilers to computer architecture. So um, it's, not, um, it's not ambitious at all, not in any way or form. Um, and we are paid by Ericsson. And the, uh, the, the target area is like uh, radio base stations with, uh, with um, both the radio um, algorithms and and and, uh, and other layer one algorithms, channel coding and things like that. So signal processing. Um, and you know there are different ways you can do this. If you're if you're a big company, you want to do uh, lots of signal processing. So one way um, is that you have d uh, digital signal processor (DSPs) programmable. Uh, programmable processors and and that's good that gives you flexibility when you want to change something it's just a software upgrade even if even if you have sold a lot of um, base stations and they are out in the woods and in the jungles of Burma or whatever and and you you realize that you want to change something it's just a software update um, but they are only so fast and they're only they, it's only it's only you have a, it's sometimes applications parallelize very well onto these machines and then you're you're happy you can add more dsps sometimes you have a limit to how much you can parallelize and in that case you need to to you, you might have a, a smallest time the smallest latency for your problem and that might not be small enough so then you do a hardware accelerator even if so so you might do that because you want you don't meet latency requirements or because it just gobbles up all your chip area or your power budget is broken so there are reasons for doing specialized uh, accelerators and 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 i mean a phone like this has a ton of specialized accelerators for doing uh, mobile communication stuff, channel coding stuff, and FFTs and whatnot. Um, but of course, I mean, they have all their own uh, nice and bad things. And the question is, can we do something that is gets you most of the um, benefit of each? And we have been trying to do this then for, yeah, this is a list of various things uh, filters, channel estimation, uh, channel coding, turbo decoding, FFTs. The LTE standard is based on FFTs, do, does a ton of, ton of FFTs. And these algorithms are mostly data parallel. With, FF, with uh, turbo decoding you have to cheat and run an algorithm which is, gives you sort of the right answer. Uh, but it's parallel. I mean, it, it does gives you the right answer if it, if it succeeds, but it might be that you you are unable to to decode a, a block. So turbo decode channel coding does error correcting codes because you lose things over the radio uh, because of noise and so on. Um, and so lots of the algorithms like FFT are data parallel, and that means that Basically, this means that they are very nice. So you could parallelize them on a multiprocessor. You could parallelize them on a vector processor. You could parallelize them on a on a multi-core on a VLIW. Uh, so this easily exploitable parallelism, and they are sort of regular. I mean, FFT. Those of you who are trying to do um, parallel FFTs realize that well, it's sort of not impossible, but there is still some quirks. It's not. It's not just a, like a adding two matrices together. It's not that regular, but it's kind of regular. 
and you have several algorithms, you have several things going on at the same time. You have channel coding, FFTs and whatever. So you could run, you could get a, fac a small factor of parallelism, five or six or seven or something, just from running different algorithms, different parts of the, of, the, of the processing chain. So, um, so we were trying to do this. And the approach we took was basically to say, well, you could, you could do this by, by starting with a, with, a, with a fixed function hardware accelerator and then adding a few muxes here and a few control registers there. And it maybe becomes a little bit more uh, flexible. Or you could uh, start from something that is totally flexible and say, OK, I'm not going to run all the code in the world on this. I know I'm basically going to run code like this. And then I throw away everything I don't need. And then I say, oh, this is lots of parallelism. I can you know, do vector parallelism and, and things like that, which, which gives me uh, lots of, of compute power for um, relatively little area. And you know, I can kind of cut my algorithms in small pieces, and I don't need very much memory per node, and, and so on. And that was basically the the approach we took. Try, try to throw out everything that's expensive from, from the processor. And of course, if you do something that's programmable, you need to be able to program it. And you'd like very much to, um, to not having to program it in assembly, because, um, because that's hard, and you do a lot of mistakes. And when you want to change something, it takes forever. So you don't change things. Um, so, um, so we started out working with a high-level language called Felspar, a domain-specific language for, um, for signal processing, which is based on this general paradigm of functional programming. And we have some, some uh, code for that, f uh, and a compiler, compiler uh, chain for that. And we can also we realize that um, it's good also to be able to, for the, for the cases where we don't generate good enough code from Felspar, it's good to be able to get uh, also a, a sort of backdoor. So th this is our inline assembly, let's see. Um, and we have a simulator for it. And what does Felspar look like? Well, it looks like a functional language. And in fact, it's today implemented as an embedding Felspar's work basically from Chalmers in Gothenburg, and it's funded by, by Ericsson in part for, for signal processing. So we sort of took the er results of that earlier project and used them in, in our work, and we had and, and s continued working on their compiler. So it basically looks like, um, looks like Haskell syntactically because it sort of is Haskell, but you uh, but it's uh, it's embedded. So actually, while this this looks like a program which um, which um, which does a SACSP computation, this is actually a program that evaluates a Haskell program that evaluates to a Feldspar program that when you compile it with the backend, does a SACSP computation. And in fact, it's it's. For those of you who are into Haskell type system, it's the type signature that actually tells the overloader to, um, to uh, uh, overload using a special type class instance for numeric things and other things. And uh, that generates code rather than actually doing the computation. So it's kind of extremely neat. So over to the machine, the black arrow machine. What is it? Well, it's it's a mesh, a rectangular mesh. Uh, no, no torus connections around the edges, and the mesh has a network. So uh, every little tile has a router. So every tile can say, "Oh, I want to send a message to the tile over here," and uh, the tiles in between don't have to. You know, their prog the programs running on these tiles don't. They are not involved at all. So it's an ordinary network. And it's, uh, it preserves message order. It's called 
It uses a routing al algorithm called XY routing or dimension order routing. It means that we first route the message in this dimension and then we route it in, in that dimension. And that means that for every pair of source and destination uh, tile, there's only one path. So this means that we can preserve message order, which means that we can preserve store order. So we're basically total store order, sort of just by the uh, design of the network. Um, because the, because the, 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 uh, the programming model is that every tile has a, um, a local data memory, and you can read and write your own local data memory. And you can write to the other tiles local data memories, but you can't read from the other tiles local data memory. So you have to structure your algorithm so you only do the remote stores, never remote loads. So you don't have any problem with latency, so you don't need any cache. But you have to, you have to think a bit when structuring the algorithm. That's a, that's a, that's a job you have to do. Um, the data path of the black arrow, it's a VLIW machine lots of functional units and of course I mean we are trying out different algorithms and we are uh, experimenting with different numbers of, of functional units but a very common this represents a very very common uh, structure that we have for many algorithms but I mean like it's not to say that this is the only possible black arrow configuration um, so we have, we have a load store unit, which does loads and stores, memory operations, and we have a lot of ALUs, and we have a two shuffle units, um, or three shuffle units, actually, in this picture. So, um, and each of these units is uh, SIMD. So these are 128-bit functional units. So you might have, for instance, 4 times 32 bits. We don't have anything bigger than 32 bits I all in one go. We don't want these long carry chains. But we have 16 and 8 bit as well. So, um, and the shuffle units are basically what they're doing is they're doing communication within a word when you want to change the order or you want to take one part of the vector and blow it up to an entire vector or swap them pieces and so on. So that's the, the shuffle units are basically the price we pay for having uh, simmed vectors. And the shuffle units uh, allow us to do, I mean, like things like FFT and so on, when you have to, when, you, when, when things are not extremely simple in memory, but only sort of manageable if you have shuffle units. Um, yep, yeah, um, precisely, and of course software tells you, software just don't, on, on, on a, on a multi-core processor, li just like the ones that the previous two talks have been, or actually the first talk this session was about, in a multi-core processor you just say, you know, these, uh, these instructions are coming after each other here in the program, and then the hardware, when it reads these instructions, figures out, oh, what a good coincidence, I'm in luck, I can do this at the same time. This is a VLIW, here you say, okay, here's one cycle, this is exactly what you're going to do. On functional unit zero, you're going to do this instruction, on functional unit one, you're going to do this instruction. So this is like, you know, very, very, very static. And we have a scheduler that's absolutely necessary when you have a VLIW machine. And, um, and we basically do basic block and uh, modulo scheduling of loops, just like the first speaker was talking about. And the scheduling, you know, it's because of the data dependencies that you can't run everything at once. Uh, but if you look at these data dependencies, you can see you can do actually the first three operations uh, at the same time and then the uh, last three operations. And it gives you a, a, a huge instruction word that's 
why it's called very long instruction word and it's like over 200 bits long. And uh, uh, with one field for each functional unit and an extra field for, for branch processing. And there is also the interconnect between the functional units is is also explicitly encoded in the instructions that the functional this functional unit is going to send its result to that functional unit on this particular cycle. Um, yeah. So we have been doing some tests, for instance, channel coding, turbo turbo coding, which is an important algorithm in, in 4G LTE networks and just taking a state of the art ordinary turbo decoding algorithm and you can use different numbers of tiles so it's a parallel algorithm it's, 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 it's a blocked uh, or block it's made into blocks um, and you can use different number of tiles depending on how large your code block is the largest code blocks are 6001 144 bits and the, the smallest code block is 40 bits so it's a very different very large range of the amount of work and what you see here is that is that th depending on if you use more tiles you can do uh, this large decoding Th so this is th really the largest decoding job so to speak uh, the largest block and it's an iterative algorithm, so it iterates, in this case, eight times. And basically, um, depending on what your clock frequency is, you can either use 16 tiles and have a higher frequency, or if you have a lower frequency, you use 32 tiles. And you see these are almost exactly the same height, these two. So it means that the turbo decoding basically has linear speed up. We have been doing FFT as well, um, which is, which is uh, I don't know if it tells you very much to say that you can do an uh, LTE symbol uh, FFT, 2048-point FFT in something like at most 4,000 cycles. Uh, we're still uh, not finished exactly with that code and um, which means that we do it in like eight microseconds and those of you who are into into uh, uh, LTE you know that you have one symbol coming every 71 and a half microsecond or something like that and these are four and eight microseconds or is very 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 uh, much less than that so it's very it's very f it's very fast it's it's you can do a lot of, of FFTs on, on a few tiles. So this is my conclusion, which isn't which isn't really adding anything new. I've already said all that. But it's it's a uh, it's a programmable accelerator. It's more area and probably power, although we haven't studied that explicitly, but it's quite a lot more area efficient than a traditional DSP and it's it's quite close to a hardware accelerator sometimes. So it's it works quite nicely. And this is for telecom relevant algorithms. For other fields, you might want to do your programmable accelerator in a different way. So questions for Carl Philip? Stephanos? Exactly, no remote How reads. Basically, is to simplify the hardware because if I allowed remote reads, they would either be slow or I would need a lot of extra hardware and complexity to uh, to um, to implement them efficiently. And I just wanted to get out of that problem, so we we get out of these these tricky 
remote reads at all because it turns out that you can actually do the programming without remote reads in in well I wouldn't s I would say in all cases that I've been looking at but I mean we have been looking at signal processing algorithms which are you know relatively simple so but but it works quite well and I, I mean it's not I haven't invented this idea either it's called remote store programming as a, as a kind of programming paradigm that other people have been been studying and it's also the adaptive processor basically supports the same paradigm uh, they might allow the reads I don't know really but they are slow yeah a mess or a mesh <laughs> Jakob What? <laughs> you never thought of that one. No, well, um, yeah, I, I l um, let's say that we think this is better. <laughs> one last question. So, how the design of the system What? Uh, application specific instruction set um i don't know exactly wh how what how next <laughs> yeah so um yeah i mean i mean this is basically a kind of cpu but it's there there are some there are some some tweaks inside which are which are kind of it's it's more it's more static than usual processors so it's it's uh, the the compiler has a higher uh, amount of um, responsibility for instance for the communication between functional units than in a, in a in a classic processor but i mean it's it is a variation i mean it's not that it this is something from mars i mean this is in the general trend of trying to go sort of you know what's the next thing beyond live the the we can we get even even closer to the silicon that that definitely is is the case that there are relationships absolutely so just one more question. You asked Ale Ale Alexandra question. Should we you just let her shoot back at you? Yeah. See? Yeah, yeah. Basically, yes. Basically, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, ba so basically, basically, you 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 look at the the sort of register dependencies, and you know these exactly. And as for the memory dependencies, the programmer basically has to tell you where where they are. Yeah, we know about it. Yeah, that's that's an interesting that's an interesting definitely an interesting thing, but it's the ton of complexity uh, for you know for the compiler, and it might be easier for this is I mean this is an accelerator that is supposed to run a limited number of algorithms, and it might be easier to to hand code them. And basically, I mean so. Just one more answer, and that, that during recently we have been mostly working on low-level programming, like C-level programming and the architecture. But basically, the, the project 
the entire project scope is that we're going to should program this in feldspar and then we get then we get some some around some of these problems because then the 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 restricted language gives us a lot of of, of dependence information so that's that's really the, the true solution is to go for this restricted language thank you so much